Hi, everybody, and welcome to Friday Night Flock Talk. I'm Robin Sullivan from the Leather Elves, and I'm with Jack Pine from High Red Bird. Hey, Jack, how's it going? Hey, Robin, I am doing pretty good. Um, once again, I do need to thank everybody who wished me a happy birthday for our last live stream. Um, and I did want to show you guys something really cool that I got for my birthday. Uh, you may notice this lamp behind me. Um, this is a very fun bird lamp that I have, and we figured we could use it for the live stream because if I have a bright idea, <laughs> I need to work on my timing on that. <laughs> There's a delay. No one will notice. It's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um it's friday yay um i hope everybody had a great week and we want to talk tonight about reading body language it's you know you and your parent and how that works and how we can use that to our advantage but i bet we have some introductions this week <laughs> So we do have a couple of things that we wanted to remind you guys about. Um, some of them may be similar if you've been here regularly. And if you haven't been here regularly, we certainly hope you will be moving forward. Uh, if you want to make sure you don't miss out on any of our live streams, make sure that you like the Leather Elves page on Facebook. If you do that, not only will you get all of the fun information whenever the Leather Elves has sales, you'll get to see fun photos of birds and animals interacting with different types of enrichment but you will get a notification each and every time we do a live stream. So it makes it a lot harder for you guys to miss out on it. Now, if something happens that you do miss out on one of our live streams, and remember, we do them every single Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we try to make it pretty easy for everyone to attend, but just in case you do miss out, uh, all of the recorded live streams are going to be on the High Redbird YouTube channel. Uh, they're all compiled into one playlist. We are at over 30 hours of information that Robin and I have pulled together for all of these different sessions in one easy to follow playlist. So if you guys would like to see some of those topics, if maybe you're starting to have commutes, if you're going on vacation, you can have those fun educational things that you guys can listen to on your drive. Uh, obviously, if you have people that are new to parrots or would like to know a little bit more about parrots, you can obviously share that information with them as well. You can always follow uh, both the Leather Elves and High Red Bird on Instagram. Uh, we both share a bunch of different fun, engaging uh, photos. I know Robin shares a lot of photos of birds interacting with all different types of enrichment. Um, I feel like recently the High Red Bird Instagram page has been overwhelmed with photos of baby animals. Uh, it is springtime, so it is a time for that. Um, but yes, baby parrots, baby goats. Um, I actually just had three peafowl that hatched out today that'll be up there soon. So a whole lot of fun things that you guys can see. Now, don't forget, we do have coming up the Place Your Bets conference. That conference is going to be June 11th through the 13th. We did encourage everybody to try to register by May 31st because we needed to make sure we had time to get you the parts for one of the workshops. Now, if you still want to register, you can still register and be able to attend those sessions. You'll get your parts eventually. Um, we just can't necessarily promise that they will get there in time because uh, neither Robin nor myself runs the post office. Um, if we did, we probably wouldn't have time for our Friday night live stream though. Uh, so I think it's probably better that we're able to do this and engage with you guys. Um, and Rob and I have also been letting you guys know that we will also both be presenting at the AFA conference this year. That's going to be in August. Um, so we're both going to be presenting different sessions. We're going to be doing a workshop together and you guys will have the opportunity to participate with a live stream in person at the AFA conference. So we definitely encourage you guys to check that out. All right. Thank you, Jack. So we never have to deal with this, either one of us. Um, but we got to talk about what is stress. So I know my behaviorist friends are all going stress. You, stress is really, you can't define stress, stress is. But we want to talk about the, the kind of colloquial use of the word stress. And we've talked before about there are definitely terms that are, you know, very specific with definitions. 
um, that, you know, we, we need to use the science piece of things, but at the same time, you know, we all talk about stress in different ways. So by definition, um, stress is a change of mental or emotional state due to different circumstances. That's pretty basic, right? Um, yeah, but wide open. Wide open, right? So that could mean just about anything, good, bad, and different. And there are, you know, it comes in varying degrees. Different animals react, you know, to different stimuli differently. Um, some animals appear from what we've observed to use stress a little bit better to handle stress. Some animals just don't do it at all. Um, you know, so, and you may get these big blowout kind of responses to what we would term a stressful situation. I mean, what do you think, Jack? Have you seen different responses from different yeah, animals? I, I think it's important for people to, again, we always come back to this idea. It really is a study of one. Um, and that can mean so many different things. So first of all, different species of animal are going to react to stress in different ways. Um, they're gonna to react to stimuli in different ways. Uh, to give you guys an example, when I was taking care of the uh, the duck lake at the Houston Zoo, uh, the Nene geese were always the first ones to explore things. They were very interested in things. They had no fear. Uh, the brown pelicans, on the other hand, uh, completely terrified of just about anything new, novel, or different. So. In terms of species, you can encounter different species that have different comfort levels. But even within the same species, you can encounter birds that have drastically different approaches, drastically different coping mechanisms. Uh, I have several umbrella cockatoos that I work with, and I can tell you guys right now that every single one of them reacts differently to new things, to different things, to uh, things that I don't even think of. <laughs> It's true. And, you know, with we've talked about this before, and I know Megan is on tonight, too. Um, and Megan has a gizmo, the Conure, and we've kind of compared back and forth gizmo and widget. And despite the fact that they are the same species, um, hey, Megan, despite the fact that they are the same species, they react very differently. I've seen them both react to things and it's it's not the same. And we've got to kind of keep that in mind. And when we're talking about stress, um, it's it can be a good thing. You know, I think we've been conditioned to think about stress or stressors as, oh, it's all awful. There's so much stress. You know, that's the way we talk about it. But that's not always the case. I mean, do you, do you agree? Yeah. So there, there's definitely different forms of stress. Um, and they are going to be entirely subjective for your different animals. So uh, typically stress can be broken down into either eustress or positive stress and distress or negative stress. Um, so, and, and those are going to vary differently. So to give you guys an example, uh, eustress could be something like riding a roller coaster. For some people, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit of stress, but it's a lot more fun. So it's definitely worth it. For some people that don't like roller coasters or if they get motion sickness, that wouldn't be a source of positive stress. That would be a source of negative stress. So you got to figure that out. And I think too, you know, we, the other thing that happens is sometimes new bird owners and, and even experienced bird owners will do the, oh, I don't want them to be stressed. And I remember consulting at one zoo and I was talking about stress and how stress could be beneficial because studies show that stress builds coping skills. And from the back of the room came this, oh, absolutely not. And I was like, what, who is that? You know, and, um, and somebody referred to the person and the person was a veterinarian at the zoo. And from her perspective, now she didn't want those animals stressed because she saw animals that were coming in with issues. And at that point in time, she was trying to de-stress things. But it's, you know, if life goes on, and I've said this many, many times in um, talks that I've given, if life is like this and it's just even, when something out of the ordinary happens, your animals don't have those coping skills to kind of deal with that if they've led a completely stress-free life. I mean, Jack, I'm sure you've seen animals that kind of, you know, it's it, they roll with the punches, for lack of a better term, are, are a little better yeah. off. Yeah. So 
Um, and the technical term for that is managing ambiguity. Um, there's a lot of research that goes in to putting together the outlines for our Friday night plot talks. So if you guys would like to use that the, that terminology appropriately, that that's what that means. And it is basically just learning to roll with the punches. Um, so yeah, uh, learning to deal with a little bit of stress, learning to recognize that things aren't always going to be, uh, you know, smooth sailing. Um, things are not always going to be exactly the way that you want them can be important for our animals. Um, for a lot of my birds, they're going to be kept outside. Their enclosure is then going to be inside another enclosure that provides secondary containment. So there's two lamp levels of containment between them and the outside world. If an owl or a hawk flies by, that can be a little bit stressful. Um, but the birds do realize the owl or the hawk can't actually get to them, but maybe it's just something we want to keep an eye on. We don't need to lose our minds. We don't need to flail, throw ourselves into the side of the enclosure, but we're going to keep an eye on that. And that that's what that little bit of stress gives you the ability to do. You learn what is an appropriate reaction to certain stimuli. And our birds do the same thing. They definitely do. And I think that's part of something that we need to, to think about is that our birds are learning all the time. They're observing. And, you know, we've talked a million times about how they're a prey species. So they will, you know, they're a prey animal. So they will be alert. They will be aware. And tonight's topic, reading body language, really kind of brings that home that so much is communicated with, with subtleties. Um, and it's really, we need to be aware of that um, in our birds and in ourselves. So, you know, I think, how would you describe how birds communicate with us, Jack? So I think for a lot of people, it's important to recognize that birds can't tell you how they are feeling in words. Um, and for, for bird owners, that can sometimes be tricky because birds are mimics. So they can sometimes use words. Um, but I think it's important to remember that they are not using their words the same way that we are. Um, they don't necessarily know what the meaning is of those words. They know what sort of reaction it elicits from you. It's the same way that Robin and I have talked about when you're picking out cues for behaviors, when you're picking out a bridge for the behavior, uh, you can tell your bird good bird as a bridge. You can tell your bird pineapple as a bridge. If you use it consistently and your bird gets to experience it in that situation, they're going to learn what it means, but it doesn't necessarily have the same level of understanding. Um, so I, I think it's important to learn how to read your bird's body language because that is going to be one of the most important ways that your bird can convey how they are feeling, what their stress level is with their environment. And I mean, there's, there's a wide range of things that birds can do to show us how they're feeling with their environment. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's up to us to be responsible enough to recognize those things. You know, it may be a change in appetite. You know, it's not, it doesn't say, you know, this is how I feel, it, but it, it'll let you know that something's going on. Um, it could be an aggressive, what you term aggressive posture, or it could be what you see as aggression. And, and that's a different definition for all of us. Um, so, you know, using the term aggression loosely, they may not exhibit the same kind of energy that they always do. You know, it may be this bird who's usually perky and all around the cage and around the play gym and whatever is suddenly kind of just hanging out. They're communicating to you. It, it's not verbal communication, um, but it is a communication. And, you know, along with that activity, if you've got a bird that's, you know, always right on toys, always, you know, interacting with whatever enrichment you offer and suddenly, meh, they're not so interested and, and they're just kind of staying away from stuff. You might want to think about what is that bird communicating to me and, and what do I need to do in response? Yeah, I would say working in animal care, one of the first things I was taught, one of the things that I have used consistently um, in shorthanding animal records and being able to keep notes on animals, uh, 
delta is used to indicate change. So delta is just the little triangle. Um, and the reason that is so useful is because any type of change is usually worth noting. So like Robin talked about, if you see a change in appetite, energy level, uh, mood or aggression, if you see a change in weight, any of those things can indicate that something is going on. Um, so that change, something being different than it has been, than it normally is, can be really, really important. Uh, I know we talked about this previously with Melanie when we were talking about avian wellness. Um, and this is part of how being able to have notes and records on your animals definitely helps you because she was pointing out she has a bird that every single year, the same time of year, she's going to notice a slight change in weight. She's going to notice a slight change because it's nesting season for that bird. So being aware of what those changes can mean is important, but noting them is really important. And, and I think too, you know, we have talked about that, that record keeping piece and Jack and I have discussed doing a whole flock talk on record keeping. So if that's something you guys would be interested in seeing, just let us know because I think it's, it's really important. And those changes don't always mean panic. You know, it's not the, oh no, my bird is inactive. What am I going to do? I need to go to the vet. Okay. Doesn't require that panic response. It just requires noting. And if you see a trend, okay, maybe then you need to worry. Yeah. I, I have a bird that before I got it, it didn't really fly. I introduced it to a larger space, worked with it. So it would start gliding, moving from perch to perch, um, using its wings the way it's supposed to. Uh, the next time I took its weight, the bird had gained 30 grams of muscle tone that it had not previously had. So it's definitely a change. That bird is reacting to something, but it doesn't necessarily mean something bad. But it's worth you knowing and paying attention to it so you know what's going on. And I think, too, part of the communication that we need to be aware of with our birds is they may be indicating through this nonverbal communication that something has changed, something in the environment has changed. And maybe it's, you know, we need to, we're not always as aware as our, our animals are. So we may need to kind of look around and go, Oh, Oh, that's what's going on. Okay. So maybe that needs to change. Um, but it is still that communication. And it's also a great way to assess your bird's mood. So if you're going in to do a training session and you walk in, you know, and you open up the door or you walk in and you see the bird in the cage or on the play stand, you should at that point kind of be able to assess what's going on with that bird um, and how are you going to handle that situation. And I think sometimes we forget that because we get all excited, right? We're going to do a training session now. It's training time. And it's like, I'm going to go in there and I'm, I'm ready. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, 10 o'clock and I scheduled this training session for 10 to 10 five and we're going to get it done. And you go in and you look at the bird and you got to kind of think for a second, is this the right time? Yeah. One, one of the things to remember with animal training, with working with your animals, you can be successful or you can fail at a training session before it even starts, if you're not paying attention yep. to how that, an if the animal's not willing to work with you at a certain time, if they're stressed out because something else is happening or uh, they're stressed out because, oh, hey, you're, you know, three hours late with breakfast and I'm convinced I'm going to sit here and starve to death. Or uh, I had an issue trying to do a training session with a bird. There was a balloon stuck in a tree. Um, and it could not focus on anything else because that balloon might be a predator. Um, so that balloon had to be removed before we could do a training session. And even then, because that balloon had been there for a little bit, the stress was elevated just a bit. The bird was on the lookout for what could be around. So being able to see how your bird is reacting to its environment, how it is reacting to you, um, even if you can find something that is stressful, uh, remove it from the environment or, you know, move it, get it out of sight. Um, for birds, out of sight does not necessarily mean out of mind. They are very, very smart animals. 
They know what is going on around them. They are prey animals, so they have to be constantly thinking about things like that. So learning to read their body language, learning to read their comfort level is one of the things you can do to best set yourself up for success when training. Absolutely. And I, I remember, I think I may have told this story on our, one of our live streams before, but we, I was have friends who are, are trainers at a, a facility and they were working on training a, an Eagle to do an A to B flight. So from one point to another, and they were like, she was young. It was a fe young juvenile, a female, and she couldn't, they just weren't having, making progress. And they said, you know, you're in town this week. Can you come over and just take a look? And it was just a different set of eyes. And I sat down and I watched their training session. They, it was in a show setting. And the bird wasn't paying the least bit of attention when the trainer was giving the cue. You know, the trainer's doing one of these, you know, hey. And the bird was just like, yeah, whatever. Um, oh, look, um, you know, it's a unicorn running by. And there was no, you know, there was no response. And they couldn't figure out why. So it, it's really... See, these kind of things happen. So it's really about making sure that you are paying attention. You've always got to pay attention. So do we want to look at some photos of birds, Jack? What do you think? And see what people, what people think about them? Yeah. So I think the really cool thing about this is, um, so a lot of birds convey their emotions um, slightly differently, but a lot of things are going to be universal. Um, so if you guys would like to tell us what you think is happening in each of the photos or videos that we bring up, um, we would love to hear from you guys as well, because there is so much experience between everybody else who is watching. All right. So this guy is, um, this is a yellow tail black cockatoo. And um, I can give you a little background. This was at a show setting in Australia at a zoo. And the, this was the look that we got. Um, what do you guys think this, this bird is communicating um, with, this, with this look? Have you seen this look before, Jack? I'm, I'm trying to see, is the, is the beak open or is it holding like a sunflower seed? The beak is open. Yep. And that Nancy noticed that the beak is open. Okay. I'm looking at it on my so, phone. So it's okay. a smaller picture. So what, <laughs> what do we think um, intent, intently watching um, mistrust? Okay. So, all right. I'm going to, this, that's a possibility. When we do this, um, Let's, I, I should also have told you, this is a very well-trained, very desensitized bird. Um, so the, where, where's your finger? Yeah, that, that's a possibility, Megan, absolutely. Um, but I think when we do this, let's try not to, let's try to see what we can read of the body language versus anthropomorphizing. Where's Patricia when I need her? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Patricia Anderson. Um, okay. Feather slick back, leaning forward. I'm going to bite you. Okay. Jack, what do you think? Cause I was there for this picture. What do you think? Okay. Um, so to me, in my experience, what I've seen from birds that are, um, you know, very unhappy with the situation because I know we've had a lot of people that are, oh, Patricia is here. Um, we've had a lot of people that are saying um, that they're, they're concerned that the bird is, you know, fearful or aggressive. Um, I, I don't know that I would be reading so much of that because the bird is directly engaged with the person in front of them. It doesn't seem overly, you know, overly stressed. Um, it might be that it's working with a new trainer. It might be that it's coming out. Um, I've seen this with my birds where it's not stress, but uh, when you have the camera out and you're taking photos of the bird, when you have electronic equipment out that they are not used to, um, you know, that, that could sometimes be a little bit concerning, um, but I wouldn't be worried about overt aggression. Yeah. 
Okay, so, and I didn't prep Jack for this one, you guys. Um, Jack hadn't seen this this bird before, or and I didn't tell him what the situation was. Um, there is, it's not fear or aggression um, that you're seeing. This bird was getting ready to do a flight and was very intent on the trainer. It was, okay, what do you want me to do now? I'm ready. Um, there, it was not fluffy because it wasn't, you know, very comfortable and it wasn't, um, good job, Cindy, paying attention to the train, the trainer, trainee, trainer. I bet you meant trainer. Um, so, and, but it's, that's what it was about. Um, and it was just getting ready to do this big, long flight around the, um, if I tell you where it was, it was at the Crocosseum. Um, <laughs> it, but this bird used to do circles and during their demonstrations. So, um, yeah, so this is just, okay, um, I'm okay. There's nothing that, you know, the trainer needed to be super concerned about. This is just a bird that's ready to work. Okay. Yeah. And so what else? Have we got? Um, I think mm -hmm. you see more of that bird's body language. You would see its body lowered a little bit, its wings out a little bit. Um, Cause again, birds are not subtle. Um, as long as you know what you are looking for, um, there's a whole lot of information you can gain. Oh, ooh. <laughs> what are you guys doing? <laughs> I'm trying to see if I can see his tail because, okay. So, um, this Amazon is very much giving me grumpy Amazon. Um, so from what I can see of its eyes, the eyes look like they are at least lightly pinned. Um, so birds control their pupils. And when the eyes pin, uh, especially in things like Amazons and macaws, um, that means the pupil gets very, very small. Um, and that's usually mm -hmm. a sign of heightened uh, excitement. Um, that bird, that is a very puffy Amazon. Um, I would be willing to bet that that Amazon is not particularly pleased with something in its environment. Let's see what everybody yeah, else. That, what, what are we, so we've got, you know, eyes pinning is a big sign. It definitely is. Candy says, um, Candy says, I don't want to. Yep. There you go. Megan, it is absolutely <laughs> the same guy. No question about it. Um, this bird, this bird was used to being in an outdoor aviary, hungry, angry jungle chicken. You're absolutely right, Tracy. Um, so Shelly, that's a great one. Wide stance. We don't always think about that. Okay. It is important to look at this bird was, is in an outdoor aviary and just, no, I'm all set. I want to stay here. I'm not coming out. Um, I was working on a project uh, regarding breeder birds. We were talking about um, how breeder birds benefited from enrichment. And I was at this this uh, home of a, a breeder. And this bird was just like, yeah, no, I'm good. Don't need to come out. Don't need to do any of that. And there is no way in God's green earth that I would have stuck my hand in there because I enjoy my hand. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, good. You guys definitely know this one. This is not, this well, is not rocket surgery. So that one, actually an important thing to point out when you point out that you're not going to put your hand in there. Um, yeah. When, when a bird is giving you all of those body language signs that it is not happy with something in its environment. I feel like that's when we get a lot of those instances where somebody says, oh, I just went to pick my bird up and he just bit me. And the bird was trying to give you every signal, every signal it could before you reached out to him. Um, mm -hmm. and, then, and then you get a bite because you ignored everything else. So the bird doesn't have anything else at its disposal to use. So yeah, a bite is a very clear thing to let you know back away from me. Um, and I figure a lot of people can figure out if your bird is biting you, it's probably not happy about something. Um, but a bite usually happens because other symptoms have been ignored, other signals have been ignored, at least in my experience. I mean, Robin, what do you think? I absolutely agree. It's the look and, and you know, for lack of a better word, stupid. I tried to tell you, 
I communicated this to you. I, you know, I pinned my eyes. I raised my wings. I moved, I moved forward. I opened my beak. Um, did you not get it? It's like, and, and then it's like, okay, I'm frustrated with you. I'm done. You know what? I'm going to bite you. And it's like our birds go through all these steps. Um, yeah, Patricia brings up a good point. It is rude to intrude on their environment. That's their home. You know, you've got this bird that's sending you all these messages and now you're sticking your hand in their home. So, it, it, you know, you've invaded their space on top of not listening. Let's think about, so we're, I'm going to anthropomorphize for one second. Let's think about how you would feel if you kept trying to tell somebody time and time again, I don't want to do that. No, I don't like that. No, I don't want to do that. No, I'm not going to do that right now. I'm really not into that right now. And they forced you to do it. Or they tried to force you to do it. How long are you going to take that? You know, and we we impose ourselves on our birds a lot of times. And it's because we're not paying attention to what they're trying to tell us. Um, yeah, birds will teach us that their communication is not rocket surgery. We don't pay enough attention. It's true. You just got to pay attention. Um, and Melissa said, so you'd never put your hand in. I, might, I would wait until the bird calmed down a little bit. Unless it were an emergency and I had to get that Amazon out of the, the building or out of the area at that moment in time, I know I wouldn't. I, I Jack, what do you think? So I can actually give you guys a little bit of experience that I have here. I have a blue fronted Amazon that inside his cage um, will pretty much react like that every single time, no matter what goes by, no matter who it is. He doesn't like people going into his cage. Um, the way that we have worked around that, he is trained to step up onto a perch. So he can step up onto the perch. I can pull him out of his enclosure uh, without risk of being bit um, because that way there's no chance of me confusing his body language. If he steps up on the perch, I pull him out and he is calm and comfortable. Uh, then we know we can train him. We can interact with him. If I pull him out of the cage on his perch and he is still giving you every single Amazon signal that he is unhappy, uh, maybe we're not going to do a fully involved training session that day. Maybe we're just going to get a weight on a scale platform and then we're going to go back to our enclosure and I will give you some space um, because sometimes that is what our birds want. Um, I know we talk a lot about what socialization our birds need. People think they need to give all of these times to interact with their birds and to do all these things with their birds. And you do, but sometimes your birds want space. They want quiet. They want you to go away for a little bit. Um, so th that's another thing. You know, and we, we have talked numerous, <laughs> numerous times about being bird centric, right? That's kind of our goal is to be bird centric. And if you look at birds in the wild, there is definitely downtime. There's downtime when a bird doesn't, isn't doing anything, just kind of hanging out, looking around, watching things. And we need to be respectful of that. We need to be aware of, okay, this is one of those times. And again, not impose yourself just because you can. Um, so, all right, this Major Mitchells, um, what do we think about this guy? The green, we, but we I, like, could, I wanted to talk a little bit about the green wing. Okay. Can we, Nick, can we make that happen? There we go. So a couple so what of things that I'm noting on that green wing, and if you guys aren't seeing anything, let us know. Um, obviously that this, this bird is focused on whoever is taking the picture of them. Um, it's not necessarily aggression. Um, but they, you definitely have that bird's attention. Um, I would note that the wings are held just a little bit out from the body, um, which is usually not a sign of complete comfort. Um, and for me, one of the things with macaws that can be really helpful with a lot of macaws, except for green wings, uh, is that facial flushing. Um, so any of the macaws that have those white patches of their face, so blue and golds, blue-throated, scarlet, uh, militaries, um, their face will flush red if they are very excited, if they are agitated. With green wings, 
for me, it's a little bit harder to read because all of the tracks on their face are red. So mm -hmm. it sort of blends in for me and it's harder for me to read that. Um, but facial flushing on macaws is a great thing to look for to, to know what to expect out of a bird. And, you know, there, there have been, he's watching. Um, Megan says he looks curious or eager. This is a store bird uh, or a bird that was in a, in a store that I visited. And um, this bird was definitely checking me out. You know, what's going on here? Um, the, one of the things, you know, Jack mentioned, the wings are slightly out. Um, the eye is, you know, clearly this was a fixed kind of look. Um, you don't have to wait for them to go through all the phases, all, you know, again, it's when you've got the eye pinning and the blushing and the wings out and the, you know, I call it the down and ready um, position. You, you've clearly pushed it to the limit. Um, so you kind of just have to be aware of what things mean. And a lot, I find a lot of times working with people on behavior, one of the things that comes out a lot is, um, I think the bird is really excited and wants to play. And that can be a possibility, but you've got to be aware of what, what does it mean for that particular individual? You know, what's that bird telling you? What's that bird What's that bird expecting in response from you? And the other thing is a lot of times our birds will go from this, you know, this look right here and you're like, okay, cool. He's interested. He's eager. And then they just go from this side and they get to here and then suddenly it starts to go south and there may not be any more overt signs, but it's like, I think of it as a scale and you need to kind of watch those and know when you're starting to tip in the wrong direction. Well, so, okay, Robin, with this macaw that you said you just encountered it in a store, so you didn't have a tremendous history with it. With the Amazon no. that you saw before, um, is there a way that you would be able to socialize, interact with that bird, um, do things without the risk of being bit um, and giving that bird a few more options? Absolutely. I mean, I think so when it comes to behavior or enrichment, you can do protected contact. It's, you know, I have a lot of people say to me that um, this, you know, this is, this is, I've got to get the bird out. I've got to work with him. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to have it. It says, I read online that it said I had to have him out for this long and, and all valid when somebody is learning how to, to work with their birds. The thing is, you can do protected contact and it's still building that relationship. You can do, you know, through the cage bars, you know, you can interact auditorily. You can do a whistle, a callback. You can, there are so many different ways you can continue to interact, continue to build a relationship and continue to build a reinforcement history with any of these birds, you know, even the Amazon, um, you know, again, would I stick my hand in? No. Would I try to work with it through the aviary bars? Definitely. You know, maybe I'd try to move him around the cage. I'd see if I could get him to go from one perch to another. If I wanted to look at his feet, I'd try to get him to put his feet up on the on the cage wire. If I wanted to look in his mouth, I, we talked last week about targeting a closed beak. There are so many different things you can do. And it, it's really about looking at the situation, reading the situation, and then figuring out how to proceed from there, which is where flexibility as a trainer comes in. Well, and if you were doing a training session with this bird, um, if you were doing it protected contact and the bird fled to the other side of the cage, was hanging on that wire, that would be a pretty clear indication that it is not interested in doing that with you. But utilizing protected contact is a great way to not only keep you safe, um, give you the opportunity to learn what your bird's body language looks like, how to interact with that bird, but to give your bird the choice and freedom in that training as well. Um, so I think that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. We, I'm working with a, a young lady that has a green wing and the bird was initially super fearful and, or f for lack of a better term, would I can describe what it was, cowering in the back of the cage, not willing to come out. And we started giving the bird choices. 
And the bird now comes out on the play stand, solicits training sessions. And it's because that, that owner has learned how to read. What does he want to do today? And she will look at him and she, you know, she sends me messages sometimes. I don't know. I, I think, you know, we didn't work today because it didn't seem like he was really into the training session. That's fine. It doesn't, you know, if you miss a training session because the bird is just, is distracted, is not, you know, acting, responding well to your requests, then, then you don't have to do it. Uh, but it gives you, an, the protected contact gives you an option. It gives you a way to, to definitely, um, you know, have alternatives, have options. So, all right. What else have we got, Nick? We can do a couple more. Okay. <laughs> so, what do you see here, Jack? I see a cockatoo that has its <laughs> crest up, which, okay, so I'm going to tell you guys right now, I have had a lot of people tell me that they have difficulty reading cockatoo body language. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I have worked with multiples. Um, I currently work with far more than I ever thought I would. Um, obviously not the same number as Shelly, um, but um, <laughs> there, there are more cockatoos in my life than I thought I would see. Um, I, I think with cockatoos, for a lot of people, it's really easy to gauge the intensity of their emotions, um, but it's a little bit harder to gauge exactly where those emotions fall because a very excited, happy cockatoo um, at times can read really similar to a, uh, you know, excited, lightly irritated cockatoo. Um, you know, that crest is going to be one of the main ways that they communicate and I think that that's where people who are new to cockatoos can fall into a little bit of trouble because they see, oh, the crest is up. They're excited to see me. And it could be that they're a little bit concerned about something. Um, so I, I wouldn't be, I'm looking at the rest of this bird's body language. Um, from what I can see, its wings are still in pretty close to its body. Um, so I don't think it's going to try to fly at me. Um, I don't think it's going to try to fly away from me. So I don't think it's overly scared, but I don't think it's feeling aggressive. Um, it is obviously, again, watching us. But in photos, one of the things that can be a little bit hard to see, is the bird fixated on you or is it fixated on the camera, which may be a new or novel item, um, which is still not necessarily a bad thing. Again, even if your bird is lightly scared of photos, take photos of that bird. You'll desensitize the bird. I mean, obviously not if they're, you know, throwing themselves uh, into the side of their cage or flying into a wall. Um, these are things that we want to try to avoid. Um, but if they're fixated on you while you're taking a photo, get it desensitized to those photos, get it used to that. And then you also have photos that you can show your vet, photos that you can use to monitor that animal's behavior. Um, Definitely. And I can tell you, so Shelly says, this one looks like you might get a surprise if you tried to reach in, but not a thug. It's true. You know, I think you might get a surprise because this bird was just super, it was excitement. It wasn't, there was no lunging. There was no, um, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't leaning as much. That lean that you saw there was more, I'm looking around these, these toys and I'm kind of checking you out. So it really wasn't, um, it wasn't what I, a, a posture that I would be concerned about. So the, you know, look at these guys. So <laughs> these, these are Jack's budgies or the budgies at the farm. And to me, this is the epitome of, it, it's just pretty, you know, we're in a group, they're a flock, they're, they're just kind of all together. They look to me. Like nobody's overly excited. Nobody is really concerned about a lot. They're just kind of fluffy, fluffy birdies. Yeah. And so one thing I did want to point out about this photo, so they are a little bit fluffy, um, but you can also tell from the windbreaks that you see on the side of the aviary and the lack of leaves on that tree. Um, it was actually 
the uh, end of fall, beginning of winter. It didn't yet have the top over it, but we did block the wind. Um, so it was a little bit cooler. Um, you'll also notice uh, a couple of the budgies in that photo are preening. Um, when a bird is checking or cleaning its feathers, conditioning its feathers, to me, that's usually a sign of pretty decent contentment. Um, paying attention to what a bird is doing with its feathers. Uh, rousing is typically seen as a sign of I'm comfortable with my environment. I have the freedom to pick up and then set my feathers back down so that they are nice and comfortable. And I don't have to worry right now about something lunging to eat me in the time that I do that. Um, so if a bird is preening, uh, it means it feels comfortable with its environment. Um, in this photo, we also have birds that are allo preening. They're preening each other. Um, which is a great socialization behavior to watch. Honestly, it's something that I can watch for hours on end, no matter the species. Um, for a lot of birds, they have a very hard time reaching all of these feathers on the top of their head, the back of their head, which is why if you get to the point where you are, uh, you know, scratching at the bird's head, picking at the feathers on their head, you can be a really good friend to that bird. That's how the bird is viewing you. It is another bird that it can trust with those feathers. Um, if you are reaching for under the wings, if you are reaching for the back of the bird, that is more than a friend. That is uh, the kind of bird you want to settle down and raise some eggs with, um, which is not necessarily the kind of friend you want to be. Um, so thinking about those things, watching your birds, um, how they're treating their feathers, what they're doing with their feathers is a really good way to judge um, their contentment. Absolutely. And, I, you know, the, the preening piece and the when you mentioned the rouse, um, so I can tell you working with birds of prey, it's kind of like that trainer goal that when you've got a bird on your glove and the bird does a full rouse for you, you're like, oh, yes, he's he's doing okay. This is I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing my job okay. And it's kind of this, it's very reinforcing as a trainer to see that rouse. I mean, these guys here, they're print, they're just like, yeah, killing, preening, life is good. And when you you mentioned the aloe preening, the preening one another, that's like super comfort, if you will, for lack of a better term, the bird, when a bird is allopreening, it's, it's with another bird focused on that other bird and not, you know, the surroundings are like secondary. So, you know, at that point that that's a pretty comfortable situation. Well, and so with these scarlets, another thing, so you see them preening like their shoulders, you see them preening the beginning of their chest. Um, that's one thing. When this bird puts its head fully under its wing, it does not care about you at all. Like it is so comfortable with its environment. It is not worried that something is going to try to grab it. It doesn't necessarily need vision for a little while. It can have its head completely under its wings. So paying attention to what part of your bird's body it is screening um, can be another way to see how they're feeling, just how content they are with their environment. And, and I think that brings up a good point to think about that, you know, Patricia mentioned, we're not going to be sticking our hands in their environment because it's rude. Um, and with when a bird is preening, is full on preening and it got the head under the wing and, you know, just watch not when you reach in with your hand and go over the head or when you, because that's like somebody coming in while you're drying off from your shower. Yeah. You know, unless you're super friendly again with that person, you don't want them in there with you while you're trying to, you know, take care of your stuff. And you, we need to be cognizant of when we are doing things, when we are approaching and how we are approaching. Um, yeah, I think that's all really important. And I know some of the things that we've talked about previously, um, I know you and I have both talked about putting uh, a perch on the inside of the door. So that gives, when you open that door, the bird the opportunity to decide to step out. Um, if you utilize something like a perch that your bird steps onto, it has the choice whether or not it wants to come out of its enclosure. Um, giving your bird that choice is really, oh my God, it's a fluffy little baby. Uh, <laughs> I, I held it in as long as I could. Um, okay. 
what what do you guys think about this video? Um, what do you think of how this bird is feeling? How, what is its comfort level with its environment? <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> It's just, it's just the, you know, the cuteness overload that's happening here for me. But obviously this is, you know, the little, the little bitty birdie and he's, you know, it's a, it's a kind of sleepy birdie. I don't know that I would have been engaging with this bird right now. I think it's um, kind of difficult to say no, but you know, it's, it's, I would kind of probably have let that bird be. What do you well, think, Jack? Okay, so, for, so for anyone who isn't familiar with birds or isn't doesn't have as much experience with birds, um, how could you tell that this is a baby? How how were you able to tell? Oh, for me, it's well. I mean, the the behavior, unless it's a bird that's kind of already been weaned and is relapsing, and around his eye as well, I wouldn't. Okay. It's, yeah, it's there. There are several different things, and just the behavior when you see the way the birds reacting to that to the seed being offered. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot of different reasons why. Plus, just the darn cuteness of it. Right. No, I, I just wanted to. That's the sure. scientific yeah, answer. Those are, things, those are all things that I would be looking at as well. Yeah, the eyes are a big indicator for me. Um, but yeah, the way that that bird is moving. Um, for me, one of the important things, that bird is not only taking food from the trainer, um, you can watch and see that it is eating that food from the trainer. Um, I know a lot of us have encountered birds that are working on building that trust. Maybe they will take the food directly from you, but they won't necessarily eat it when you are right there. Um, they may hold it in their beak. They may hold it in their foot, but not eat it. Because again, if you're eating it, if you're using your beak, using your foot to hold food up to your beak, you're going to be focused on that food. You're not going to have the same ability to fly away if needed. So seeing a bird that is eating comfortably in front of you after taking food from you, that's usually a good indicator that that bird has some degree of comfort with you, um, that it's not overly concerned. I love so, how she uh, yeah, has <laughs> In the face. And and the other part of Shelly's comment that um, if it were an older bird and you pushed on the beak that way, it might not have gone, gone the way you wanted. Um, so yeah, that, that is true. Um, you know, we, again, you can't make them do everything or do anything. Um, it's really yeah. about, about uh, letting them kind of do their thing. So this is the last one I think we're going to do because we've got a couple other things we want to talk about. What do you guys okay. see here? This one for me was a great example because the, you know, there's, there is a lot of, there's stuff going on with the crest, obviously, but the wing, the little wing tremor that's happening there and the wing being away are pretty subtle, you know, and unless you're really kind of keyed into what your bird's doing, you might not notice. And what do you think, Jack? Yeah. So, um, so Tim, Tim said that he thinks the bird is nervous. Um, and honestly, that's probably about where I would put it in terms of, I don't think the bird is scared. Um, if you watch how it's moving its head forward as it's moving around, it doesn't seem terrified. Um, but you'll notice that the eye is staying on the person that is, uh, doing the recording. So obviously the bird is paying attention to that. Um, even if you can't see that light wing tremor, um, you can see that those wings are held a little bit further out away from the body. Um, again, that's usually just a sign that your bird is getting ready to fly. Um, now that can mean a couple of different things. If your bird is doing that directed towards you, uh, that could mean that, uh, it is that Amazon was ready to fight, um, that, that could have, it was directed right at the person taking its photo. It was go time. Um, for a lot of other birds, it can be that I'm, you know, wings out and pivoting away from you so I can get away because you might be a predator. You might be something a little bit scary. Um, but those wings out, you know, th that's two completely different behaviors. Um, but 
it will give you an indicator that, hey, that's where we're leaning rather than completely content. Right. And I, one of the things I wanted to touch on too um, is that, like I mentioned, the down and ready position. A lot of times people will mistake that for dancing, will mistake it for, um, and as well as like head bopping and regurgitation, people will say, oh, that means he wants to play or he wants to dance. And to me, the down and ready is I need to protect my face um, or I need to get out of the way so this bird can go and have the freedom, the choice to go someplace else. It's not a, I want to stay here and interact with you posture. And with regurgitation, a lot of times people do will encourage that because it's fun to do this and get the bird to do it back. And a lot of times that just leads into a, again, a way better friendship than what you guys really want. Well, and like you were talking about with that, you know, sometimes it's perceived as dancing. You know, there, there are some birds that, you know, are excited and want to, um, what we would call dance with you. Um, cockatoos have, have very large body movements. Um, you can usually get those pretty easily. Uh, kikes have um, pretty significant body movements and they're, you know, they're very bouncy. They're known as the clowns of the parrot world for a reason. Um, for a lot of other birds, um, you know, if you're seeing that light shifting from foot to foot, the adjusting of the weight, um, if those wings are starting to come out as they are shifting their weight, they are getting ready to launch themselves off of a perch to get as far away from that spot as quickly as possible. Um, so paying attention to your bird, knowing what you are seeing, what is happening um, can be a little bit tricky. But the more you pay attention, the more notes you take, um, the better you're going to get at this. Mm -hmm. I think we have one more video for us, too. Did he have one more? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So the disclaimer on this one is this oh. is stock footage. Oh. And Jack nor I are responsible for this clip. Or we do we know the person who did this clip? So ignore the clip, first of all. Um, second, this is kind of, this is down and ready that I'm talking about. If you look that, at this bird, a, that, that's, that's a different yeah, down he, and ready. That is a different down and ready. But I have had, you know, folks in over the years who have said to me, yeah, look, he really, he's really wants to play in, in not such a, in an overly friendly kind of way. Um, so, you know, you, if you start seeing this behavior, you need to back up just a tiny bit, um, and, and think about what's going on here and how can we manage this in a different way? Um, yeah, it, he, he might, um, Tracy, uh, I think he's probably a little bit more friendly, um, than that. So we just, you know, we wanted to put this in here cause you might see this. It's definitely a possibility. Um, he, he. I'm not so sure, Adrian. I think he might want to stay um, overnight. He, he um, just say, yeah, he he might be ready to leave. You know, when when he's finished and has had a cigarette. Um, that 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 <coughs> bird is very, very clearly um, gratifying himself. He is. This is a PG version. This is, you know, a kid-friendly uh, live stream. Yeah. So let's just leave it at that. Um, so now we're going to move on. You had to thank bring up that last one. Um, thank you, Patricia. Patricia is always the consummate professional. Um, I. This is why we need Patricia in our lives, Jack. I'm just saying. Um, I love so video clip first response from Karen and Anderson that we've had in this session that I saw. <laughs> yes, and this is true. Um, all right. So the other side, and we got to be kind of quick about this, the other side of reading body language and communication is your body language. Okay. So sometimes it's about approach. We all have different approaches. 
You know, maybe you're a big, tall guy and you, you approach with a real heavy foot. Maybe you're this little dainty thing and you approach really lightly. Maybe you move really quickly. Um, maybe you, I have known more people say, I think that happened because I moved too fast. And it's definitely true. It's, you know, when you, you, you've got this, this animal here that you're trying to build a relationship with. And you're pretty much, when you move really quickly around a bird, you're pretty much doing the equivalent of this. I mean, it's, it's there. They are immediately put on like a defensive posture. You yeah, know, I would, I would say what, I, yeah. I've worked to train that and condition things like that. in a lot of my birds, because obviously I use birds for presentations with small children where obviously they're going to yell when they get excited. They're going to move as they're getting excited. So I have a lot of times where I have to start with a bird with very calm voice, very controlled movements. And gradually, as we are working, we build up and the gestures and the movements get more exuberant at the bird's comfort level. Um, so we're working mm -hmm. on desensitizing that bird to what they're probably going to encounter as a presentation animal, but definitely getting them used to that at their comfort level. Um, you know, we talk so much about watching your bird, learning from your bird, their body language, and at the very least, just enjoying them, you know, getting to see all of the fun things that your bird does. It doesn't just, it's not a one way street. Um, your bird is going to be watching you. Um, I know we probably have a lot of people that have birds in their living room. How many times do we have people who have been doing something that did not involve your bird? And all of a sudden you look up and your bird is on the side of the cage fixated on you because you are doing something that they find incredibly interesting. Your bird is paying just as much attention to your body language as you should be paying to its. Absolutely. You, you really need to be self-aware. You know, when you share your life with any kind of animal, whether it be human or non, um, you really need to think about what you're doing. Think about how you're acting. Um, are they big? You know, some of us have bigger, grander uh, body movements. You know, it's, some of us talk with our hands and it happens. And if you're doing that, you just have to be aware. You know, I, um, I have a feral cat, uh, not, she's no longer feral. She, you know, got hurt and we took her in. And, um, and one of the things that I have to be really careful of is that I don't make any super quick movements with her because although she's lived with us for several years now, she is still very aware of what I'm doing and where I am at all times. You know, and we've talked about them as a prey species. They want to know where you are and what you're doing. And they are always aware. It's, they, I want to say, you know, birds, maybe not just birds, but all prey species, but birds in particular are very, um, are very aware of what's going on because they have to be, you know, that's kind of instinctual for them. And we need to to make sure that we are create. We talk about creating a, a a positive environment, and part of that is the the other beings that inhabit that space. They have to be comfortable with them. So we want to think about that and watch it. Okay, so we're gonna say it again. Are you ready? Everybody ready for it? Record your training sessions just because that way you can see what you're doing. You know, there, sometimes the smallest gesture that you make will affect your bird's interactions and you've sent them a message through your body language. The other thing is if you come into a training session and you're like, <sighs> and it's, you know, you're all like frustrated and if you're in a hurry, you're not gonna get the results you're looking for. Um, and it, if it, it becomes like, oh, I have to do this training session and I'll just get it over with and be done. Yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things. If you record those training sessions, we have told you time and time again, you are probably going to notice something in your bird's body language, in your timing, in your bird's reactions that you didn't see. I can guarantee you are going to see something in your body language, in your reactions 
that you were not aware of. Because when you are doing a training session, you are fixated on the bird. So you may not necessarily be paying attention to how you are moving, how you are doing things. Um, maybe you're using larger gestures than normal and the bird is reacting to that. And uh, you could, you know, I've had people say, well, why is this bird afraid of me? It's like, because you're doing this and you really need to start with like this. Um, I don't you know, know that's one of the things. A window. Well, that's one <laughs> of the things too that goes with, with training. So when you see, if you go to a, an event or a facility and you see a trainer that's using these big giant gestures, honestly, I would prefer to see a trainer that's using very subtle, very small gestures as long because the bird can see them. The bird can see what you're asking for. If you're using a gestural cue, they can see what you, what you are doing. And it's not, it's not about these, you know, fly. Well, it's not necessary. It, it's really not. And so when you, when you're getting into training, when you're working on training and, and really trying to perfect your skills, you don't have to be the big grand, you know, the, the Las Vegas show um, kind of gestures. It's, it's really much more subtle than that. And Another, one other thing that we really, really wanted to touch on tonight was um, height dominance. Okay, it's not a thing. What do you think, Jack? All right, so <laughs> Rob and I like got into a very involved discussion about this one day. Um, both of us agreed that where your bird is in terms to you isn't going to control how it's viewing its environment. Um, but I think a really important thing for people to remember is if your bird is somewhere that is very difficult for you to reach, if you have it on a perch that is out of your reach and you're having to stretch to get it to step up, if your bird is on your head um, where it's harder to get to, if it's on your shoulder where it's harder to see, um, you know, you can have a little bit of difficulty reading its body language, interacting with it. Um, so I think for a lot of people that becomes correlation, but not causation. Um, height dominance isn't a thing, but if your bird is up somewhere high, well, why is it difficult to deal with? Why is it harder to interact with? Because your bird is cueing off of your body language and paying attention to you not being very comfortable. Um, because I've noticed the same thing with birds when they go low. Um, I have birds that like to go under furniture um, and I can experience the exact same thing because I'm, you know, on my knees trying to reach under furniture to try to get them to come out. I'm not comfortable with my body position uh, and they can pick up on that. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Patricia said, please do a program on this height dominance as a myth. Um, we might, maybe we should do a Mythbusters uh, flock talk because um, it's true. There are so many things that over the years have become ingrained in our, uh, you know, in our vocabulary as bird people. And they, you know, these phrases that people throw around and you go, yeah, no, that, that's not always the case. And it is really about um, it's, it's them reading you and you reading them. And so just, the height dominance thing, they're not trying to tell you that they're, you know, top of the flock. They're not trying to tell you that they're, you know, the flock. They have, my other favorite is the alpha bird. Yeah, no, no, not happening. So, yeah, maybe we do need to do, you know, we, we knew this was going to be one of those topics that, that definitely um, needed to be expanded upon. But we wanted to put it in here because we thought that it really went with your body language and your bird's body language. So, yeah. We, um, we, although we have had numerous people talk about the idea of us doing a, you know, myth busting type session. Um, and I think that that could be a really bright idea. So cute. I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you were able to work that in. That's important. Um, so, I think, you know, just to kind of conclude tonight there, we've, we've laughed a lot tonight and we've, but this is such an important topic. 
it's really about the way your bird handles different things, the way, and your bird's going to read your behavior. Every bird's going to read it differently too. You know, maybe there's a bird that's really gets very excited and animated when you use those big giant gestures. And in that case, it's okay. So we really want to think about observation, observing your animal's body language, observing your own body language, and really trying to make them work together because it's that it's again, it's that partnership and that relationship that we want to foster with the birds. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a balancing act. What do you think, Jack? As as you guys are working on that, um, remember it is a study of one. You need to pay attention to your individual bird But no matter what your starting point is, you can definitely have a goal in mind. Robin and I have talked about this time and time and time and time again. Everything that you are doing with your animal should be goal-based. You should have an idea of where you are wanting to go. Um, As you are wanting to learn to deal with stress, learning to read um, your bird's body language, increasing your interactions with that bird so that you have the opportunity to see how they're reacting to different things. Uh, Recording what you are observing, um, write Mm -hmm. it down. It'll definitely help you pay attention to that. And, um, you know, using training and enrichment to get your bird used to a wide variety of different things. Because at the end of the day, not all stress is bad. Um, We talked about this from the very beginning. People started mentioning it in the comments. I think Adrian mentioned it in the comments before we even started talking about this, that stress, light stress, helps you build coping mechanisms. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it can be a great way for you to interact with your bird, to pay attention to new things that you didn't even know your bird was doing or ways you didn't know that you could interact with your bird. So, again, these live streams to me... One of the important things we've been trying to drive home is to help you guys enjoy your birds a little better and enjoy them in new and different ways. Um, Maybe not like the Scarlet Macaw was enjoying things, but um, in in different ways. Um, And I certainly, you know, I I think that there are a lot of ways that you guys can work to enjoy your birds, um, interact with your birds. Absolutely. So we have a trivia question tonight um, for those of you that are here. What is the term for when birds preen each other? So we talked about this several, we mentioned it several times. You know, it's, it's about, it's about being here. If you, if you listen and pay attention, um, you know, and the topics aren't always rainbows and unicorns, but You know, we do mention those things. Pardon me, what? I said he's going (laughs) to run around now. No. (laughs) I didn't train him that well. He hasn't hasn't mastered that skill yet. I'm working on it, though. Oh, wait. (laughs) So, and because you all laughed and smiled... We've trained latency. We've allowed latency to occur, but that's okay. We'll talk about that another time. Adrian Mock says, allopreening. And tonight's prize, Jack, do you have a, you have a prize there? Yes, I do. So um, we are actually, so we gave away um, the penguin last week. And this week I have a snowy owl. Um, so Adrian, if you want to go ahead and send me a message, I will get this sent out to you. Um, you know, we, we've been trying all sorts of different prizes. We're always going to include prizes as part of our live streams because we believe in the value of reinforcers, the value of reinforcers. But we've told you guys before, um, you have to pick the reinforcer that is right for you guys. So, um, if you want to send us a message, let us know. Um, you can comment on this live stream. 
what kind of things would be reinforcing to you guys? What kind of prizes would you like to see? Because I know in the past, Robin and I have done things like consults um, on different topics. Um, let us know what would help you out because again, that, that's part of why we're here every single Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. There we go. And so next Jamie. week is the Bets Conference, the Place Your Bets Avian Conference. And you can still sign up. You can still register at theleatherelves.net. But, and I will do my level best to get your kits out to you. Um, but you will get them definitely get them, but I will do my best to get them to you before Friday. And so Friday night next week is a little different um, because we are starting the conference Friday evening and with a happy hour, but we are going to still do the live stream because we love you all and we want to be here for you and consistency is a good thing. So next Friday from seven to eight, we are going to do a question and answer series, question and answer session. So if you guys want to get your questions together and really don't make them too hard because Jack and I have to, you know, we're going to be doing the happy hour afterwards and I can't promise that we won't start the happy hour before that. Um, so questions and answers. Diane got her kit already. That's awesome. We love the U S postal system. Um, and so definitely, you know, questions and answers, think about them throughout the week. And if we don't have an answer for you, we'll make it up. No, no, wait, that was the wrong answer. If we don't have an answer for you, we will try to find it. Um, so next week, question and answers. Um, hopefully that will help. And we, oh, I do want to tell you that we are not veterinarians. We play one on TV, but we're not veterinarians. So um, we really can't answer medical questions. Okay. Um, again, you can definitely sign up for the bets conference if you would like. And if you have nothing to do in August and you feel like traveling, Jack and I will be at the AFA conference. We are doing an in-person live stream. Wahoo. And you never know what can happen at one of those. Um, so check that out at afabirds.org and you can still sign up for the, our conference. And I think that's it. Jack, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I am going to point out that, so at the AFA conference, we're going to do an in-person live stream, but Robin and I are also doing a workshop together. And then each of us is doing an individual session as well. So if you, you know, absolutely love these sessions, if you love what you are learning, um, you know, please come out and visit us in Minnesota. We're very, very excited about this. Um, and I am competitive, so please, more people come to my session than Robin's, because that will reinforce me. Uh <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not about numbers or anything like that, but yeah, you should come yeah, to my right? session. What? <laughs> um, the I'll have unicorns in my guys. session. Oh, you're going to have unicorns in your session? We also do just want to remind you guys, first of all, thank you so much for tuning in. We are here every single Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can watch these live streams live on the Leather Elves page. If you haven't already, make sure that you like the Leather Elves page. That'll give you notifications whenever Robin is doing fun sales, whenever she has fun uh, enrichment ideas, enrichment photos that she posts, because she does that pretty regularly. But you'll also get a notification when we go live. So that'll make it a lot harder for you to miss one of these live streams. You can always subscribe to the High Redbird YouTube channel. Um, because if you do miss a live stream, you can go and watch them all over there. We are now at over 30 hours of content that Robin and I have put together for you guys. Um, they are all part of a playlist. So you can go, you can watch that over there. Um, I, I can't really think of a better way to spend your time, especially if you have a commute, if you guys are going on a road trip, uh, maybe if you guys are driving to Minnesota in August for a conference um, of some kind, you know, that could be a good thing to do. Um, but again, a really fun session, at least for me. I hope you guys 
enjoyed this. I hope you guys learned from this. Um, I really can't thank you guys enough for always tuning in, um, always being engaging. Um, this has become one of my favorite things to do every single week. Um, and thank you guys so much for being a part of that and making this so engaging, so reinforcing for us. We really, I mean, we do enjoy it. You know, there are definitely um, times when Jack and I have other things that we need to do. And it's like, oh, I got to do this. I got to do this. I have to be honest, that never happens when it comes to the live stream because we really do enjoy interacting with all of you. So we're going to let you go. You're absolutely right, Terry G. Minnesota in the summer is better than Minnesota in February. So Janice is going to be driving to AFA. She's going to be listening to the, to the live streams all the way there. Um, I will be driving as well, not from the same direction, but, uh, and Karen, you never have to be on your best behavior. We would be disappointed if you were. So you guys take care. We will see you for the question and answer session next week, uh, seven o'clock on the Leather Elves uh, Facebook page. Take care, everyone. Good night.